power. Wide Sight TV. So Hugo, you're here at Global Offshore Wind showing River Simple's hydrogen car. I'm sorry if this is a stupid question, but can you just give us the basics of how a hydrogen car actually works? <laughs> yes, a hydrogen car is an electric car, but it doesn't have any batteries. Uh, normally in an electric car, you store all the energy in batteries and they're very heavy. In our case, we store all the energy in hydrogen, a cylinder of hydrogen, and that goes through a fuel cell that generates electricity on demand. So we carry 1.7 kilos of hydrogen, and that can power the car for 300 miles. And a fuel cell is basically electrolysis in reverse. So in school experiment, you put electricity into water to break the molecular bond, and out comes hydrogen and oxygen. When hydrogen and oxygen combine, normally they go bang and give off all that energy as heat. But in a fuel cell, you put the hydrogen and oxygen back in and allow them to combine without burning, and they give off the energy as electricity. So it's exactly the same process as electrolysis in reverse. And that goes to motors in all four wheels. So, so Hugo, do you, th do you think that hydrogen cars will outstrip the demand for regular electric cars? Well, I think it's not a question of either or. We need both. After all, we don't argue about solar PV or wind turbines, which, can, which one's going to win the renewable energy race. So they're just different and we need them both. And the same is true of batteries and hydrogen. But they are different and we need both for different applications. And we can decarbonize quicker if we pursue both technologies. Unfortunately, we have a headlong approach to just battery cars in Europe. But if you look to the Far East, Japan and Korea, it's a very different story. We need both technologies. So we often hear that 80% uh, of journeys are less than 20 miles, and that's probably true. And it's what we need battery electric vehicles for. But what people never point out is that 80% of miles are driven in the other 20% of journeys. And that's what we need hydrogen for. Hydrogen is necessary for long-range vehicles or for high-utilization vehicles. That's why we need it for HGVs. It's not because they're large, but because they do long range, and you really can't do that satisfactorily with batteries. So I believe there's a role for both of them. The company is set up with an environmental agenda. Our purpose is to pursue systematically the elimination of environmental impact of personal transport. And for that, we need green hydrogen. And uh, there's no doubt that there's a, there's a lack of green hydrogen supply at the moment. We're already suffering from it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about green hydrogen, but unfortunately the, uh, the government strategy is very much a twin-track approach, as they call it, to green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. And, uh, and we want the green variety, so offshore renewable energy is vital, really, for a renewable, sustainable transport sector, as far as we can see. Offshore wind uh, has enormous capability to generate electricity. It's obviously non-dispatchable. It generates when the wind's blowing. We can't store electricity. We're not saying that all offshore wind should be used to generate green hydrogen. But certainly, green hydrogen is a sensible use of any potentially curtailed energy. It sounds as though you're very much thinking about a collaboration with the offshore wind sector. Tell me what that might look like and what stakeholders might be involved. We're very keen to work in the entire value network, as we call it, with all the partners who have a shared interest in the sustainable transport future. And so uh, I think that, the, that there is a lot of focus on green hydrogen at the moment, largely as a result of the, of the government's hydrogen strategy. Well, not largely. I mean, it's in response to, but it's all going hand in hand. There's a lot of focus on green hydrogen, but the focus tends to be on production of green hydrogen. And transport is the high-value-added uh, um, uh, market for green hydrogen in the f initial periods of penetration. It's a much higher value added product than hydrogen going into industry. And so we, it's a really great opportunity to justify the investment in electrolysis to create this green hydrogen. The trouble is a lack of demand. And uh, infrastructure providers, we, we need to work with infrastructure providers and they need to work with us in order to create the entire value network. There's no good having the supply without the demand. Um, I've read that uh, the business aims to follow a circular model. Would you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, the, the, the business is, 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 uh, has always been focused on mobility as a service. 
we'll never sell a car, we'll only ever sell a service contract. And this is not to be confused with a lease. A lease is a, a way of managing demand when the economy goes soft to try and keep cars moving out of the factory gates to maximise consumption. Uh, in our case, uh, the, the sale of service uh, model is designed to align our interests with those of society and those of customers and of policy makers. It's designed to reward resource conservation rather than resource consumption. So if we sell the service to the car, at the end of the three year contract, the car comes back to us. The customer's contract includes a monthly fee for having the car and a mileage rate that includes everything, including in the fuel. And at the end of the contract, the car comes back to us. We don't sell it into the second-hand trade. We provide the second, a third, a fourth-hand customer. So instead of obsolescence and high running costs, our interests are longevity and low running costs. Exactly what customers want. We also have a vested interest in efficiency. And, um, and, and if we're going to have a sustainable future living off renewable energy, as with, with, with finance, we understand sustainability in finance, you have to live off revenue, not capital. But if you're living off revenue, the revenue comes, is, is available at a fixed rate. And you have to manage your spend to meet the, the supply. We live in a capital-based world where we dig oil at, out of the ground at the rate we need it. We manage supply to meet demand. If you're managing demand to meet supply, energy efficiency becomes orders of magnitude more, efficient, more important. And I don't see how we can ever have a sustainable industrial society whilst businesses are rewarded for the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. So we need to make efficiency profitable. And the sale of service model means that we're rewarded for efficiency because we're paying for the fuel for the life of the car. And that, it, it, making efficiency a source of profit rather than a cost to industry is a much more effective way of improving the efficiency of all demand sectors uh, than regulation ever can be. The other big advantage of the circular economy is that it de-risks our economic future. If we, uh, we recognize that uh, a renewable world is much more dependent on rare earths and critical metals that are in short supply. And we need desperately to conserve those. If we keep them on the balance sheet of companies building cars or building wind turbines or whatever, then they stay within the loop and we can gradually decouple all our revenue from virgin resource consumption. And that has got to be a smart way to insulate business against future commodity price shocks. But I think it's a very interesting observation that a renewable industry is much more dependent than a fossil fuel based industry on critical materials, rare earths and so on. Wide Sight TV.